Praise the Lord. Well, we're in the book of Acts again tonight, and we're in the 18th chapter, and we are starting tonight at verse number 12, Acts 18, verse 12. Uh, as you all know, we are dealing with uh, the, what happened with the early church, how the whole thing got started that continues till today. And one day I said in Sunday school, when we were talking about the book of Acts, I said, the book of Acts is still going on. And because the church age, even though it's not being written like that, because the Bible is complete and finished, but we know that the, the church is still going on that was established through the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, thank God that he is still merciful and reaches out. Aren't you glad Amen. that God reaches out and that God wants to save everybody? You know, that's, that's why Jesus came into the world and died on the cross was because God wants to save everybody. He doesn't want anybody to be left. It's not his will that any should perish, the Bible says. And that should be our cry too. You know, we should have that strong cry in our spirit and our heart that none be lost. Uh, will there be people lost? Yes, there will. But uh, they, they need to, the ones we know need to go, need to go, if, to, go to hell over our prayers. They have to step over our prayers to get to heaven, get to hell because we're praying for them. And even if they end up not responding to that and not receiving Christ, let it be the obstacle is our prayers that's reaching out to the throne of God for them. So, you know, I always say you trample over the blood of Jesus to get there because Jesus died to keep you from that place. And I'm sure that nobody here tonight is planning on going there, but you know, people that we meet from time to time are making a choice what they're going to do with their, with their lives. They're either going to live them for Christ or not. So we must be open to the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul did. You know, Paul, after he, his great conversion, he began to go everywhere preaching the gospel. You know, that's what Jesus did when he was here. You know that? The Bible says he went everywhere teaching and sharing and ministering the truth of the gospel and healing the sick and all the things that he did. He went everywhere. Why? Because he was reaching out to people. The, the religious people criticized him, didn't they? Because he was reaching out to people all the time and they all thought they were better than the normal people. There's still people in the world like that today. They think they're better than the ordinary people in the world. But I want them to know one of these days they're going to stand before God and find out that's not true. You know, just because you got a lot of money or a lot of power doesn't make you any better than somebody who doesn't know anything, doesn't have any power. In, in the eyes of God, God doesn't look at that. Thank God. We're all on the same level. And so uh, this is what Paul was doing. So he met opposition everywhere he went. You know that. We get a little, uh, get our feelings hurt a little bit and we meet a little bit of opposition, don't we? Yeah. Oh, I get offended. They rejected me. Uh, they were ugly to me when I tried to talk to them about Jesus. <laughs> you know, the Bible clearly tells us that, that he was rejected and he was hurt by this world that he lived in. And if we're going to be his disciple, guess what? Everybody's not going to like you. Some people are going to be ugly to you. Some people are going to tell you they don't want to hear anything about that. And you have to be bold and you have to just stand and you may not have, you may not go back to that person. You may just get there one time, but you know what? I, everybody that I know, I want them to know one time for sure from me, what Jesus means to me and, and the opportunity for them to know him as I know him. Cause I'm going to tell you, there's nothing better in the world than knowing Jesus. Nothing better in the world, no amount of money or no amount of anything in this world that's better than loving Jesus and knowing Jesus. So I definitely want to share him. There's enough to go around. <laughs> you know. So in verse 12, it says, And when, when Galileo was the deputy of Acacia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Now, does anybody remember what God just told the Apostle Paul in, in a few verses back. Do you remember last week we talked about just a few verses back, God told the Apostle Paul, don't worry about being persecuted because I have many people in this city. Remember that? We taught that. God gave Paul the assurance before he went through the trouble. 
I'm telling you, first of all, I want you to understand God is on your side. He is not against you. God wants you to succeed. He's provided everything you, you could possibly need to succeed. The, the debt's been paid. The provision has been made for you to succeed. God wants you to walk through things with victory in your soul, come out on the other side singing glory hallelujah because you've walked through it with his assurance. So God wants to give you that assurance. He is no respecter of person. He's not better to the apostle Paul than he is to you. And anything he has ever done for anybody in the scripture, he will do for you. So God had already given him the assurance. Have, how many of you have ever really received the peace of God before you walk through something? You really, maybe you didn't even know that you were about to walk through it, but after you got through it or in the process of it, you were amazed at how you had already been prepared for that. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever done that in your life? Yeah. It's like, boy, you, you start out through a difficult thing and, and you think, you know, and most people look at you and think, how are you going to go through that? But supernaturally, and we're talking about um, Carol's sister and their son dying at a young age. And we saw my husband's brother lose their daughter at a young age. And the amazing thing, I have not, I'm not close to Carol's sister, but I was close enough to David's uh, brother and his wife to see the miraculous peace that they got going through that. I mean, when I put myself in their shoes, I'm going, there is no way, you know, <laughs> there is no way that I could ever walk through that. But they walked through the passing of that young mother, daughter, and, and they came out on the other side with peace and they both still have peace today. And that is a supernatural work of God. And God did many supernatural preparations for the apostles in the scripture. You can trust him to carry you through if you'll depend on him. If you're dependent on yourself and you're dependent on other things or other people to help you get through junk, guess what? You're going to struggle all the way through and you're going to end up in a mess before you get through the other side. But if you will understand that he is your provision, and that he desires you to walk in peace and, and to be comforted. And, and know that if you'll just be sensitive to his Holy Spirit, he can speak to you before you ever get to that point and start giving you some peace and provision before you ever get there. And then when you get there and you face the obstacle, you will be amazed at the supernatural provision. You know, when our house burned down, <laughs> We didn't know that was going to happen that night when we went to bed. We didn't know we were going to get up at 1130 and our house be on fire. We didn't know that. But I can tell you for me personally, and of course I wasn't the one who was going to have to replace the house. But for me personally, supernaturally, my husband can tell you, supernaturally, I had unbelievable peace. And, and I'm not really a person who likes to be out of my comfort zone much. He knows that. You know, I like to have my, you know, <laughs> I like to be in my own spot, my own stuff, you know. But for those over four years that we were rebuilding that house, he knows that God gave me a supernatural peace. And because he knew, I want you to understand that God knows what you're going to go through. He already knows what you're going to go through. And if you'll just listen and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, he will carry you through things and he'll prepare you before you even get there. And it'll be amazing to you how God will work things out. He's, he's an amazing, amazing, amazing friend. So they uh, start an insurrection against Paul. It says with one accord. Now it doesn't mean everybody in the town did. Sometimes when you're reading in these scriptures in the Old Testament and the New Testament, He'll say everybody, and it's really dealing with everybody in that particular area because you don't want to take it as the whole world sometimes. So everybody in, in this group of people with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. And they began to make accusations against Paul that were not true. You're going to be lied on. 
Come on, sometimes you're going to be lied on. Let me tell you something about it. You can't always go fix every one of those lies. You can't. You can't go around and, and pop bubbles and be sure that everything stays in order all the time. Sometimes there are people just going to believe a lie about you until you die. Amen. Amen. Come on. Uh, so uh, somebody has lied. Has anybody ever been lied on that's in the house tonight? <laughs> <laughs> been lied on. You know, all of us have. All of us have. We've been lied on. And it's what a sad thing is that people who lie on you sometimes hurt other people that don't really know anything, but they just believe somebody's lied. For the rest of their life, they believe something about you that somebody told them. You know what I'm talking about? You know what? That's just the way life is. You're just going to have to say, God, that's in your hands. And if you don't fix it, I, I'm not going to try and I can't. You can't keep those things straight. So they lied on him. They said, saying, this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Wait a minute. This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law? You know, they're talking about the law of the Old Testament, the law of Moses. They're not talking about Roman law. They're saying, I, I think that's a crazy way to say it. This fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. So, in other words, they're, he, they're really worshiping God, but they're not doing it to suit me. Come on. What a sad thing. We need to get over some junk, church. You know, different people worship God in different ways. And we don't need to be so judgmental over people that are worshiping God a little different from you as long as they don't try to make you do it too. You know, you should have the freedom to worship God the way you feel like worshiping God and you shouldn't have to worry about what other people think and you shouldn't worry about what other people think. So uh, each of us individually, you know, there are things that people, people do in worship that I wouldn't necessarily do. In first place, some, some of those things I'm too old to do. But, <laughs> but even if I wasn't too old to do them, I might not do some of those things. I, but I'm just going to let God deal with it. I'm going to let God deal with it. And if they're truly worshipers of God, guess what? God's going to fix it. Amen. Any of y'all ever done some things before and you think that's stupid later on? I got my hand up. Oh, that was a stupid thing. I'm just following what other people are doing. I don't need to do that. You know, but, but thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his mercy. And, and he loves us and, and he puts up with our goofiness. <laughs> Hallelujah. He puts up with our goofiness and he, he loves us and cares for us. But these guys, I thought that was a crazy accusation. And it says, and when Paul was now about to open his mouth, in other words, he's waiting for an opportunity to tell uh, the, the council what he was going to say. It says, Gallio said unto the Jews, um, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O you Jews, reason would that I should hear you. But if it is a question of words about uh, words of names and of your law, Look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such. And he drave them, or drove them, from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes. Now, you know, when people get mad, they just got to do something mean sometimes. Come on. Sosthenes was not even the chief ruler that had given them trouble. Remember I said the chief ruler was converted to Christianity, but Sosthenes is the one that they picked to replace the one who had been converted to Christianity. But it didn't matter. When a mob goes crazy, they just do anything. They'll, they'll, they'll hurt anybody. And that's what happened here. They didn't get their, they didn't get their solid uh, support from law enforcement, so they went out in the streets and they took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat and Galileo cared for none of these things. The, the Roman ruler didn't care what, they, what those people were doing. But these, you know, don't, don't, the Bible says in one place, don't follow a mob to do evil. We need to be careful who we're listening to. I don't care if it's on the news. I don't care if it's in a conversation around a, a dinner table. I don't care where it is. You know, our commitment to Christ is to stay lined up with the Word of God. That should be our commitment to Christ. 
You know, I'm not trying to make God into a Republican or a Democrat. I'm not trying to make God, you know, I'm deciding wh which one God would be and I'm going to be on that side. That, that's not the way we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to be on what, we're supposed to follow God. We're not supposed to be uh, one of those people that's out there wandering around trying to put God in a category and, and make him fit in our scheme of things. We're supposed to say, Lord, thy will be done. Amen. Let me be yielded to you and your purpose. Let me be used of you. Let my life reflect you and, and not be moved by these things. So don't follow. In other words, don't, I really would say almost don't follow anybody but Jesus. You know, I realize we have friends and Christian brothers and sisters in Christ that are trying, you know, that are living to the best of their ability by the grace of God, letting their lives be yielded to the purpose of God. But you know what? They should never be our focus of how we're supposed to live. Because there's not a human being on this planet that's not going to fail you occasionally. Somebody you have a lot of common sense may hurt your feelings. Come on. Somebody you really love and is a close friend might turn from you. And if that's where your focus is, I'll tell you something, you're going to get kicked in the gut and you're going to be down for the count. But I have a friend who never has ever disappointed me, never has ever turned against me. Even when I was in my stupidity and rebellion and hard-headedness, not knowing which way to turn, he still had nail-scarred hands reached out, loving me, loving me, even though I wasn't really loving back. That, because that's the kind of God we serve. So don't follow a crowd. Don't follow a bunch of people. Just because everybody's doing it doesn't mean you need to. Come on. Just because everybody's doing something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. God wants you to be totally lost in him and follow him. And that old saying they said years ago, what would Jesus do really is important that I understand when I'm walking through something, what choices would he make? Not what other people might make, but what would Jesus do? So that's exactly what happened in this story. They couldn't beat up the Apostle Paul. They couldn't bring him out there and, and do him harm, or maybe even they wanted to kill him. But instead, they went over there to the synagogue and got Sosthenes and, and brought him out and beat him, the Bible says, before the judgment. Doesn't even tell you why. Doesn't even tell you anything the man did. They just went as a mob. I want you to understand mob mentality is dangerous dangerous, brings destruction all over the place where it goes. So then it says in verse number 18, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. So he stayed there and then took his leave of the brethren and sailed thence unto Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in, in Centuria, for he had a vow. Now the scripture doesn't tell us everything. Just like, just like Brother Roger said a while ago, I don't know what kind of vow Paul had. The scripture doesn't tell us. Don't go out and shave your head just because Paul shaved his head, in other words. That's what he's talking about when he says don't build a doctrine on things that are written in the book of Acts. You don't have to go shave your head. You know, you know have you ever made a vow to God? Anybody ever made a vow to God? Boy, that's a scary thing. You better be sure you talk and know what you're talking about when you start making vows. But if you make a vow to God, doesn't mean you got to shave your head just because Paul did. That's the point. So, so in this case, Paul shaved his head. I don't know why. It ain't no sin. If you want to go shave your head, go shave it. <laughs> uh, I lost my sound. I, I, I'm, I'm out of sound. I need another mic. Okay. Um, who's up here? Yeah. Alicia or Carol, go ahead. There you go. Oh, there. Oh, Perry, you are doing good. He's, he's out running you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. 
Where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> and he came to Ephesus and left them there. That means he's leaving Priscilla and Aquila. Remember I told you about the Apostle Paul found people everywhere. You know, he was a people person. And, and, th and God will make you into a people person if you surrender to him. He really will because God loves people. You know, my nature, most of you know, my nature, the old woman, you know, that old woman that I have to keep hitting over the head every now and then. Uh, Carol says I'm playing, what is it, wacom a <laughs> Wop, shut up, you know, that old woman sometimes uh, wants to get back up there. And so I'm kind of a hermit type person. I, I am not personally a big people person. My husband is. But with the transformation of the Holy Spirit in my life, God has turned me into a lover of people. That's God's work in me. And so just because you have something that maybe your nature is, like you're not a people person like I wasn't, the Holy Spirit can work in you by the grace of God and turn you into a person that loves people, truly loves people. I used to say I loved people, but that didn't mean I did. It had to be a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in me to cause me to truly love people. And so whatever it is in your life, God wants to bring you through to that. So Paul, everywhere he went, he found people. He found people, once they learned the gospel, once he taught them and they learned the gospel, you know what, he invested in them. Many times he took them with him to different places and he trained them, spent the time putting them and then he spread them out to keep them doing the work of the kingdom. You know, the greatest compliment to any pastor or teacher is when the people that you teach and bring up start actually operating as, as a minister of the gospel, getting out. Uh, I'm not talking about a credentialed preacher. I'm talking about just going out and actually doing the work of the ministry. And when you see people start doing that, that you've touched, that you've helped, man, it's just amazing. It's so exciting. You know, I teach that ministry class for the teenagers. And when those kids that Sunday morning, man, they just let the Holy Spirit touch them and use them po so powerfully. Guess what? That thrilled my soul. That thrill my soul. It don't make me jealous. I don't go, well, I don't want them to do better than me. Not in a million years. My daughter, Kathy, you know, our daughter, Kathy. <laughs> my husband's shaking his head back there. Our daughter, Kathy. You know, people compliment Kathy and talk about what a great minister she is. You know what? That doesn't insult me or make me feel bad. Hallelujah for Kathy. I pray she goes way beyond anything that we have ever been able to do. And that's the heart of the Apostle Paul. He wanted to bring people out. He wanted to, people to be used of God and issued into whole different areas. So Aquila and Priscilla was a man and a wife that were greatly used of God and he took them with him and then the Bible says he left them there uh, and in, in, in uh, um, Ephesus, no, in Corinth. That's where, he, that's where he did. He left them in Corinth and he came to Ephesus. That's where, yeah, excuse me, now I'm straight. And left them there. And he himself entered into the synagogue with the Jews. So he went ahead and it, remember what I told you about? The apostle Paul went to the synagogue everywhere he went because that was where the established church foundation would be laid. Now, Jesus also went to the synagogue where he went. As, as Roger said, he was living under the law, but he was the only perfect person on the planet. I love this point to make, so listen your ears up. This is one of my favorite points. Jesus was the only man on the planet who ever was perfect, right? How many of you know those synagogues weren't? They weren't perfect. Uh-uh. I know they weren't because I've been to Israel and they got so many laws they've added to the law. When you go over there, they got so many laws, you know, they, they are so um, gung-ho about the law that on, on Sunday morning, on Saturday, when they have their Sabbath, a, a neighbor, a reprobate neighbor has to come over and push the button on the microwave to heat up their lunch. Because the Orthodox Jew won't go push the button on the microwave to heat up their lunch. It's all about stupidity of making your own laws. 
So <laughs> Jesus went to an imperfect synagogue. Trust me, I know that because there weren't any perfect ones. And guess what? If you go to church in America, come on, you're going to go to an imperfect church. Here's one right here. You're going to find, I remember uh, quite a few years ago there, we used to have some smokers. I think most of our smokers done got saved. No, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. Y'all know I'm joking. I don't think smoking will send you to hell. I really don't. But there were some people that used to stand out and smoke on the, on the side of the building. And this little girl walked in the church. She's probably about 12 or 13 years old. And she walked into church that day and she said, there are people smoking out there on the parking lot. I said, yeah, and there's probably somebody in here telling a lie or at least told one this week. She went, oh, really? I said, yeah, because these people that go to Oasis, they're just, they're not perfect. You know, we're not, we're not perfect people. So don't go out there as, as some people do and, and disqualify everybody. Some people disqualify everybody. You know, Paul could not get the gospel out to the whole world. Do you understand? Paul could not get the gospel out to the whole world. He was just one man. He went and he did some great things, but he was just one man. So he needed people like Aquila and Priscilla to bring them up. And so if he had just walked around all the time thinking nobody was good enough for him to use, I hope you're listening if he, just, if he just decided nobody's good enough for me to use, to minister, then he would have never seen the great move of God and there wouldn't have been a growth in the church because he would have eliminated too many people off the list that God could have used. But instead he trained and he worked with these people and then he established them doing the work of God and then he had the peace and the confidence to leave them there. That's such an awesome thing. Let us be trainable so that when someone puts us in a position, they don't have to check on us all the time. That was a good thing I just said. Let us be trainable so that when somebody puts us in a position, they don't have to go check on us all the time. Come on. Because we are sold out to what we need to be doing. Amen? And then it says he entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So during this time, as he was establishing Aquila and Priscilla there, he was still teaching because Paul never shut up. He was always teaching the gospel. And when they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. So he made the choice to leave. He left them there to remain, probably to be the head of the church there at that time. It says, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that comes in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you. So he was probably planning to go there um, it, uh, during the Passover. And he says, I'll return to you if God will, if God will. You know, the Bible tells us in one place that everything we do, we should say the Lord willing, the Lord willing. And that really is a verse in the Bible. We don't just say it because it's an old saying. It really is in the scripture. I didn't look it up. I could for you. But my husband can probably tell you. He's the encyclopedia back there. But uh, the Lord willing, we, you know, we, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what the rest of this evening holds. So he knows. And he also not only knows, but he has the best plan for us. So therefore, he may lead us, he may divert us. So it's always good to say that. So he said, if the Lord's willing, I will come back to see you. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And he is about to begin his third missionary journey. You know, everywhere the Apostle Paul went, there were many times, you know, he was, he was stoned. He was left for dead. He was uh, just, just maligned in so many ways. It's unbelievable. And not only the Apostle Paul, but all the apostles. All the apostles. They said that the Apostle John was thrown in a hot vat of boiling oil, and he swam to the other side and got out. He was set free. The Apostle John was the only one who lived and died a natural death. God kept him. He wrote the book of Revelation, as you know. So he was the one who, who lived, but doesn't mean he lived without persecution. 
He was severely persecuted. Many of them were dragged through the streets of the cities until they were dragged to death. Many of them were crucified. The apostle Peter was crucified and he said, don't crucify me in the same way Jesus was crucified. Turn me upside down. So they call it St. Peter's cross because he was crucified upside down. The, uh, the apostle Paul was in prison many, many, many years of his ministry. He, he worked out of prison. People came to the prison for him to preach the gospel to them. And when it came time and the judgment was finally settled, they walked him out to have his head chopped off. And on his way out, he asked them to please not, not cuff his hands or tie up his hands. Let him walk freely out to the, the, whatever it was they used to cut his head off so that he could lay his head down willingly to give it for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he eventually gave his life for the gospel. These people truly gave their life for the gospel. It wasn't a put on, it wasn't a, you know, when it gets down to this kind of thing, there aren't any fake Christians volunteering. <laughs> there aren't any. You know, you're not gonna be a fake Christian and volunteer to go out and get your head cut off. So it, it kind of sorts out this kind of persecution. I pray we never see it. It's happening right now in Ukraine. People that are Christians are having all kind of difficult situations to face. Uh, but, uh, in, and in other countries, many countries, Christians are being persecuted just for being a Christian. Any Islamic country, they're being persecuted for just being a Christian. Well, it sorts out those churches over there in Saudi Arabia don't have any false Christians in them. <laughs> they don't have anybody there that's just for position or power. Those people that go to church in these countries, they're the genuine thing. They are ready to give their life for the gospel's sake. I pray that that never happens. I, I have no desire to go through that kind of a society. But I can tell you one thing. I've always said it's true, that whatever God allows you to go through, he gives you the grace to do it. I said, whatever God allows you to go through, he gives you the grace to do it. Amen. I wanna say to you again tonight, before we close, that we serve a good God. He loves you. If you messed up today, all you got to do is repent. All you got to do is say, Lord, I, I did this. I sinned today. God doesn't say, well, go climb those stairs with, with, with glass, uh, pieces of glass on them so you cut your knees all up. And then when you get back down, I'll think about it. No, <laughs> that's not right. Jesus went to the cross and bore in his body all the suffering all the agony he bore in his body so that all you have to do now is to reach out to that provision and ask God to forgive you for your sins. And you know what? He is faithful and just, the scripture says, to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So thank God there's none of us that don't need forgiveness from time to time. All of us need forgiveness from time to time. And I'm so glad to tell you that God has never one time laughed at me and said, I'm not gonna forgive you. you. You messed up too many times. Now I've said that to God. How many of y'all said that to God? Lord, here I am again. I made a mess again. I did the same thing again. You know, you know, we do that. And someone said, God says, what was that? I don't remember you ever doing that before because why God's the only one who can truly forget. We don't truly forget things. We, if we let them go, we let them go, but we don't truly forget, but God truly forgets. Every sin you've ever put under the blood of Jesus, God has wiped it away and he will never remember it against you again, ever, ever, ever. Hallelujah. That's how the peace of God can keep our hearts and lives in Christ because we are serving such a wonderful God. If you want to know how good God is, just get, look at that cross and imagine that suffering Jesus hanging up there. That's how much God loves you. So he's on your side and he wants you to make it by the grace of God. Amen. 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 He's voting on your side. He's voting for you to make it by the grace of God. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. We'll begin there at verse number 23 next week and start that third missionary journey. We love you. God bless you.